Our next speaker is Kashama Sawant. Kashama is a Seattle City Council member and activist with Socialist Alternative. She was first elected in 2013, running as an independent and accepting no corporate money. She campaigned on a $15 minimum wage for Seattle's workers and taxing the rich to fund education. After helping lead Seattle's 15 Now movement to victory, she was re-elected last year despite the determined opposition of Seattle's Democratic Party establishment. Please help me in welcoming Kashama Sawant. Thank you, sisters and brothers, for giving me this opportunity. I was actually, the first thing I was going to say was something that Mohsen had, has already said, that uh, UC Santa Barbara, your campus, was the site of the largest million student march demonstration on November 12th. And, yeah. and what was remarkable about November 12th was that it sort of, it's, it's one of those many events in this current era that signifies that we are experiencing a historic shift. It was the day that U.S. campuses joined an international wave of student protests, and it was a nationwide call to action. And as Mohsen said, you know, it, it really happened through Bernie Sanders saying on television that really there should be, I mean, it's outrageous that we have over a trillion dollars of student debt and that we are saddling our, our students just, you know, we're, we're penalizing them for getting an education. We're penalizing them for doing exactly what they were told to do, and that there should be a million student march on Washington, D.C. And incidentally, it was Socialist Alternative, my organization, that just the younger members of the organization, the student members who initiated that call. And it's a sign of the times that it was taken up in such a big way. Nationwide, 10,000 students on more than 100 student campuses, uh, you know, college campuses, marched out. Many of them walked out of classes. And as Mohsen said, the demands were $15 an hour for all workers on campuses, tuition fee, public college, and cancellation of student debt. There was another thing remarkable about November 12th, and that was that parts of the labor movement, especially the National Nurses Union, uh, joined these protest marches on campuses. They had presence on all of the actions because they wanted to make a very important point that has been lost in the decades that activism has been decimated in the United States and, uh, and worldwide, which is that the labor movement and student movements, labor movement and campus movements, need to join hands together. and. Every historic era of successful movements that we've seen, not just in the U.S., but globally, has, has, has had campus movements playing, uh, beginning to play a catalytic role in triggering movements, but then going on to play leadership role as young workers along with the labor movement. And that's been a very key lesson of what's happened in the past. But, there's, uh, but there are other signs of what's changing in our society, and, and, and I think that is a very important f a message for us to take in if we are going to talk about what alternative system we should be fighting for, and that is that there is a massive anger and turmoil in U.S. society, and a mass number of people are looking for something some way to fight against the corporate domination of our society. A very recent survey, just I think a few weeks ago, found that today's college, today's generation of college freshmen are more likely to participate in protest movements than the freshmen were in the 60s and 70s. And when the survey looked only at black students, they were even more, in greater percentages, uh, likely to participate in protests when they went to their college campuses than students as a whole. Last year, there was a wave of campus demonstrations. In fall of 2015, students at more than 120 schools across the nation held anti-racism demonstrations. They had walkouts, sit-ins, marches, and rallies. And the most recent indication of what's happening is 
the communication workers of America, you know, Verizon workers all across the East Coast, 40,000 workers are now on strike. And they're, of course, on strike for a fair contract. They're, they're on strike because their pensions, their living standards, their workplace security, all of the things that they had fought for bitterly in the past era that uh, Emily referred to, you know, when, when the New Deal and all happened, that was when the labor movement had its heyday. All of that is under threat. And that has a lot to do with what kind of system we should be fighting for for the future. But they're also fighting for public access to broadband and telecommunications technology. Their fight, their strike is important if we as a society want to fight against broadband, broadband redlining that is going to happen otherwise. And so we see so many indications of what is, I mean, I think this is the most important thing we have to uh, not miss. We would, we would have done ourselves and future generations a major injustice if we didn't recognize that there is a historic shift in consciousness right now. And for those of us who may have been in activism for years and may have experienced very difficult years, there were very difficult years to build mass movements, we have to shake off the cobwebs from the past because there's a whole new generation on, on the horizon now that wants to fight back. And, and, and the biggest, and I don't think this is, uh, this is very much debatable, the, the biggest expression in our times of the latent anger that is coming to the fore is the response that has been uh, attained by Bernie Sanders' campaign. I mean, here's a guy who, running as an open socialist in the belly of the capitalist beast, he is calling for taxing Wall Street speculation, but that's not all he's doing. He's also, you know, he's, he, he when, I don't know if you all noticed this, but when the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, not a friend of students and workers, said, Bernie Sanders is dangerous to us. Sanders, Bernie's response was, yes, I am dangerous to Wall Street, and that is absolutely correct. This is, this is incredible. Some of the speeches that we've heard on mainstream American television are perhaps the most radical that have been, ever been heard since Martin Luther King's speech at Riverside Church against the war in Vietnam. We are, we are, in a, we are at a threshold of something really incredible but we have to make it so obviously. And I'll also talk about the other side of the indication of the changing times, and that is the rise of Donald Trump. And I think we have to absolutely, I mean, there's, I would say, two key uh, you know, lessons that we should take from Trump's rise. And, the, and one of those lessons, let me say at the outset, is not that the mass of America is turning right wing. If anything, I could tell you so many reasons why America actually has not only, is not only not turning right wing right now, it has never been right wing. The mass of ordinary Americans has been well to the left of the political choices that have been on offer for decades. But Donald Trump's rise does signify a couple of things. One, it shows that there is a real danger of the rise of right wing populism, right wing ideology. And if anything, it is a grim reminder for us on the left that we need to build our forces. Because if we don't, then what is happening is not that Americans want to be right wing and want to be xenophobic, anti-immigrant, Islamophobic, and so on. Of course, there are those complexities in our society. And not everybody is made out of one sort of a purity of, you know, we live in a system that breeds these hatreds and bigotry. That is true. But the point is that Trump has become a pole of attraction to a real mood of anger against the establishment. It's just as Bernie Sanders has become a pole of attraction to those you know, mil tens of millions of young people who are looking for a way to fight back. And to me, Trump's rise is a reminder that we have to build the left, because if not, then the right will occupy the vacuum. But, it's, but more than anything else, it's a sign of the times. It's a sign that people are fed up, especially young people, young women, young people of color are fed up with the status quo. They are fed up with the domination of corporations in our society, in our economy, uh, in our social order, in our politics, and are looking for not only a way to fight back, but there is an openness to a broad-based transformative social change. 
And I wanted to connect what's happening today, though, to what I would say is the norm in human society. We are taught under capitalism because it serves the needs of the system as somewhat like what Emily was referring to. It serves capitalism for us, those of us who don't gain from it or gain to very small measures, that for, for, for us to buy into the idea that humanity, the human race is selfish, self-centered, we are, we are born competitive, and we, you know, it's all, you know, dog eat dog, and that's the way human beings are. So what can you do? It leaves you with this sense of despair and inexorability. You know, what can you do if the human race is evil? But it's not, that's not true. As a matter of fact, if you go, and just to give you a concrete example, this is, you know, far from the only thing you can say about this, but just one concrete thing. If you go to, and I was talking to uh, people earlier this morning, when we, if you go to fair.org, you know, fairness and accuracy in reporting, if you go to fair.org, they have polls, opinion polls, on every possible issue, all the way from, you know, what should be done about poverty, should the rich be taxed, should the military budget be curtailed, should there be single payer, you know, publicly funded health care, should there be public funding for education. The whole spectrum of issues that, that constitute a human society. If you look at the opinion polls, right from the time of the Truman era, the American public is to the left. And so if you look at this globally, it is even more overwhelmingly true because globally many generations haven't been, uh, you know, haven't been indoctrinated into capitalism in the way that uniquely happened on, in, in the United States. But globally, every evidence of human, humanity's evolution shows that human beings are actually geared towards cooperation, as was talked about earlier, collaboration, really nurturing one another. These are also human traits. And what I would say, I'm not a psychologist, I'm an economist, but I can tell you this. If you look at human beings, we, you know, we are complex organisms with all kinds of traits built in inside us. You know, in circumstances, the same person might be selfish, and in others, another circumstance, the same person might be extremely kind, and even, uh, you know, uh, giving to the point of giving their own lives. We have seen any number of examples of those. The question is, do we have a system that enhances and encourages the traits of cooperation and collaboration, or does it force people into fighting for scraps while a sliver of human beings at the top take away the lion's share of the production of wealth in society. And so if you look at it that way, you will see that the problem is not humanity or what's in the DNA of human beings. The problem is the system that we live in and the conditions that it forces us to live in. And so, to you know, if you want to discuss what is what is cap, you know, capitalism is the system, dominant system we have globally. If you look at that, and if you want to understand that, uh, understand what follows capitalism, or can capitalism be reformed or regulated? What comes after it, and so on. I just wanted to take a concrete example, like climate change, to talk about one, the nature of capitalism itself, and then what I think as a socialist, why socialism is the system, the global system that we need to fight towards. And so if you look at climate change, at this, at this moment in time, in 2016, what are the obstacles to really fighting climate change, meaning concretely going away from a use of fossil fuels into clean, renewable, energy-based economic prog progress? What are the obstacles? The obstacle is not that a mass of humanity does not know what climate change is all about. At this moment, we don't face that barrier. If we were having this discussion 30 years ago, we would be having a different kind of discussion, but not today. Today, virtually, uh, there is a consensus both in the scientific community and in the community at large that this is an urgent crisis, and we face, the planet faces, uh, faces real peril. I mean, you know, the peril of incineration if we don't do something about it. That is, that is not a barrier. Is there a barrier in terms of technology to move towards renewable energy? I'm sure there's can, a lot of research needs to be done still and can be done. We are co perfectly capable. We have the creativity and the ingenuity to do it. But at this moment, there are more than enough tried out ideas that offer us concrete alternatives to fossil fuel based economies. So what is the obstacle? The obstacle, and this is where I think the heart of the discussion, in my view, should lie, is political. The obstacle is that 
90 companies, just 90 companies, and when I say companies, I don't mean the workers who work in that corporation, I mean the oil executives. 90 companies are responsible for two thirds of the carbon emissions since the dawning of the industrial age. And now do we, another question I wanted to ask you all is, is there an obstacle that the oil executives, the big oil lobbyists, and the multi-billionaires don't have the brains to understand what's happening in climate change? Of course not. And let us never make the mistake of thinking that they're stupid. They're far from it. They understand what's happening with climate change. So what is the obstacle? Why won't they go on towards you know, towards a policy of leaving, you know, leaving every, every new drop in the ground and going towards renewable energy. Why has it happened that despite massive demonstrations in Copenhagen and Paris and even before that, every climate talk season ends in complete failure? It's because the system of capitalism in which the oil corporations, the, the goal of the oil corporations, like every other corporation, is to amass the maximum amounts of profits in the shortest possible time, is at complete odds to the need to move towards renewable energy. And so, until and unless we confront the question of the, you know, the, the incredible resources and wealth that are in the hands of a tiny sliver of people. The oil lobby is just one example. We're talking about multi-billionaires who own, you know, this much, and we all, the rest of the seven billion of people, you know, we own this much. We're talking about those multi-billionaires, the real capitalist class. We're not talking about people who make six-figure salaries at Google or Microsoft. You know, there's a difference between working people and those who own the lion's share of resources in our society. We cannot even begin to have a real solution, a real alternative to climate change, unless we talk about how we are going to take into democratic public ownership the resources that are in the hands of the major corporations of the world. And that, my sisters and brothers, is, would be if we did that, and, I, and I'm, I apparently I've really run out of time, but I, I, but I do want to bring up a couple of things, a couple of points uh, for our discussion. And one of those is, uh, you know, that, that in order to do this, what would it take? And if we did it, what would it look like? And so when I call myself a socialist, I mean that I am a fighter for democratic socialism, which, will, which would be a global economy that would run, and society, economy and society that would run in the interests of the 99%, you know, run in the interests of the ma majority of humanity. And that would mean what? You know, we, could, we can fill in the blanks, but basically what it would mean is the, having the ability to deliver a decent, a high standard of living to all human beings by virtue of being human in an environmentally sustainable manner. That's, that's in a nutshell what socialism is. But the reason I'm a socialist and an activist is not simply because I subscribe to that idea. It's one thing to subscribe to that idea and quite another to actually achieve it. And this is where I feel that unless we talk about political struggle, we will not be any closer 10 years from now than we are today to achieving that vision. I mean, it's absolutely essential to have a vision of society that is able to function in, an, you know, in a non-insane manner, unlike right now, where not every action is geared towards maximizing profits for a small group of people, but instead for the good of humanity. And all the examples that the previous talk had about uh, cooperatives and other forms, the solidarity economy, those are all, I, I find them extremely encouraging because they are live examples that we don't need an exploited worker, worker an exploiting boss model to carry out productivity in our society. Productivity is not by the Koch brothers and the Warren Buffetts and the Bill Gates. Productivity is by the workers who go to work. If the workers in Santa Barbara decided to go on a one-day strike, this entire city would come to a complete standstill. That is the power that workers have. And so we, we are completely capable as human beings of running an economy that is productive, 
and nurturing without that kind of exploitation and oppression. And, and I think the solidarity economy and the cooperatives are live examples that prove that. But I think that you cannot really achieve you know, that for the mass of hum humanity, for globally, simply by saying that we are going to have cooperatives in, in a few areas because of several reasons. One is if you look at what's happening globally right now, you will see that the process of exploitation and oppression under capitalism is always going on. It just appears in different ways. Just because capitalism is in crisis right now, which it is, just because the political system is in crisis right now, which it is, it doesn't mean that the juggernaut of oppression and exploitation ever stops. Just to give you one very concrete example, the indigenous peoples who have lived for tens of thousands of years on the eastern coast of India, my home country, have lived such an economy for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, where they have had their own independent economy without becoming part of the modern, you know, modern capitalist economy. They were extremely, you know, to, by all accounts, happy and self-satisfied, and they had, didn't have the need or the desire to become part of the mainstream. But do you know what happens under capitalism? Under capitalism, as long as the, I mean, the reason you cannot have a kind of utopia under capitalism is because as long as capitalism is in existence, it means that the power and the wealth to decide what happens to the fates of people is in the hands of the capitalist class, the bosses, the billionaires. So what has happened to these indigenous people? Despite their desire to stay away from the modern capitalist economy, they have been pillaged beyond belief because they just have the misfortune of having lived in land that is rich in minerals. And that is necessary. Those resources, those raw materials are necessary in order to keep the machinery of capitalism going. And capitalism is going to take the capitalist class, it, the indust so-called industrials, they're going to take those resources by hook or by crook. So even if they resisted, they resisted with their lives. The, the, the ruling class will not relent. As a matter of fact, massive, uh, you know, army, uh, you know, sort of violence and destruction and rape of women has been used as a coercion and oppression tactic against these people. And I don't mean that everything under capitalism looks so gruesome. I just use that as an example for, to illustrate what I think is the logic of capitalism and hence what the logic of our movements has to be, which is that we cannot, despite our best intentions, we cannot really establish a just global society unless we actually build a political struggle against the capitalist class. We just don't have a choice. I know that the reason people want to look away from it is because it sounds daunting, because it sounds like you have to take a side. Well, guess what? You have to take a side because it is not a neutral situation. This is class warfare, and as somebody said, and I'm, this is not something I invented, I'm quoting Barbara Ehrenreich who said, it is class warfare under capitalism, and it has been aerial bombardment against the 99% so far. So it is absolutely a moral imperative, but as I'm saying, a logical necessity outside, you know, coming out of the system that we have to fight against the system. There is no way of ducking the question of political struggle. And that is why we need to build mass movements, not only to win reforms like $15 an hour and so on, uh, and for single-payer health care, but those movements need to mature themselves into a, a, you know, sort of understanding a vision for a future society, but also those struggles cannot remain limited to reforms as hard as they will be. I can tell you from our experience of fighting for $15 an hour, we, we succeeded. It was a historic victory for you know, working people as a whole that we were able to win $15 an hour in Seattle and now it's gone nationwide. And Hillary Clinton recently claimed that she supported 15 in Seattle. Well, she didn't. I was there. I, I would know. Uh, but my point is, and, and I'm not being facetious, my point is that fighting for $15 an hour in Seattle, in one city, showed, demonstrated to people that it was going to be an almighty battle against big business in order to win even these minimum of concessions from capitalists under capitalism. 
Imagine the kind of struggle it will be to win reforms like the kind that Bernie Sanders is calling for, single-payer health care, taking on the insurance and pharmaceutical industries, taking on the financial oligarchs. They're not going to sit on the, on the sidelines and allow us to win victory after victory on reforms. We absolutely have to fight for every reform that we can win, but while, while we're fighting for reforms, we will be forced to digest the lesson that it will be hard enough to win those reforms, and guess what? If we keep winning those reforms, they're not just going to stand there and accept it. They, there will be worse oppression and, and, and you know, worse, worse sort of retaliation. We will see other methods. We haven't seen red baiting yet. We will see that still, we, that, that, will, that will happen. You can take it from me. So what do we need to do? We need to build towards a vision, in, a, in my view, of socialism, that is a, an economy that would work for the global humanity, and that simply means harnessing the resources and technology that are available under capitalism in order to deliver decent standards of living for everyone. That means what? It means that you cannot have an economy that both allows billionaires to remain multi-billionaires and solve the problems of hunger and po poverty. Those two things cannot happen at the same time. You have to pick one. And what happens under capitalism is that the more the wealth flows at the top, the less there is at the bottom. And for anybody who says that capitalism is not a zero-sum game, don't ever believe them. It is very much a zero-sum game. So we have to move away from that to a genuine democratic socialist economy. But the only way to do that is to actually build an international political struggle. There is absolutely no way of avoiding that question of struggle. And young people will always be at the center of that struggle. So I hope that you will all get involved. Thank you.